Uh, but then I worked in um, teaching English for foreign language, mostly doing teacher development work, which meant I got back into the same country, so I could continue uh, working with those connections. So I worked in uh, educational development work for some time, and then just by chance, about 15 years ago, uh, I met some people who were setting up a, uh, a learning and development conference working organization. And I, I joined them, and um, that grew into a different partnership, and in the last five years, I've had my own company uh, once again. And, uh, so, in, in a sense, I, you know, I have to confess I'm a, I'm a jack of all trades and master of none. So, taking it on that level, I'm interested in touching into different areas and seeing what comes up. Um, as Belina said, I've also worked a lot with stories, and I've written a number of books of stories, so I'd like to start with a story. And you might have seen that puzzle that was up here earlier on. Can you all see this, by the way? So, okay, good. I'll try to keep moving around sometimes so people... <laughs> there was a traveller who started her journey early in the morning before sunrise. And she'd been traveling through the desert all morning. And it was about 20 past 11, and she was hot and tired and thirsty, and she came to a oasis. And it was one of those oases where there are huts, habitations. And she slipped off her camel at the first hut and knocked on the door. And a young man answered, and she said to him, I beg you, young man, in the name of Allah, the merciful, for the great gift of water. And the young man turned, went up, came back with a clay pitcher full of clean, pure, clean water, and gave it to her. And she took it. But before drinking, thirsty as she was, she said, I thank you for the three great gifts of life, the gift of water, the gift of generosity, and the gift of life itself. And then she drained the whole pitcher in one swift draught and gave the young man the pitcher back. And she said, you've given me the three great gifts. Now what can I do for you? And he said, well, I, I don't know if you can help me because, well, it's difficult. You see, my father passed away some three or four weeks ago. And in his will, which we adhere to very closely in our culture, he left to me and my two older brothers his herd of camels. And that's our difficulty. For the last few weeks, we've been fighting and struggling and at each other's throats because we have 17 camels in the herd. That's a pretty good phone you've got. That's a pretty good that, So 
only 17 camels. <laughs> <laughs> yes, said the traveller, and as it happens, the one remaining is the one that I gave you, so if you wouldn't mind, perhaps, <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to give me it so I can be on my way. So just turn, <laughs> just turn to two or three people around you, just take 90 seconds and two minutes. What does that story say to you about what leadership could be? What are the gifts of leadership? Secondly, as somebody said to 
be able to give away what one considers one's most precious resource for the greater good. And isn't that just what improvisation is? It seems to me, and this is something I want to explore, that, that leadership in, in its broadest sense and what improvisation offers are in many ways one and the same thing. And you know, to, 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 be, to be in an improvisation situation, and I, I guess we've all known this, is that the ego wants to present one, one great idea and something up for me, and yet what the present moment is calling for is something much, much more than that. It would keep Johnson to be obvious. That's what's calling us. It's that present awareness. So that, that brings me to a sense of, of, of asking ourselves, and particularly when we think about the world of business, how we can move from the world of scarcity to the world of abundance. Now, I think in many ways, in material terms, uh, we have got to manage scarcity because that's the world we currently live in. But in some of the things that came up in some of the, the, the uh, responses I got when I asked about what the story said for you, in things like generosity, in love, in energy, in wisdom, the more we give out, the more we tend to get back. You know, and a nice metaphor for that is, is the, um, the Dead Sea uh, between Jordan and Israel. I mean, the, that sea is dying very rapidly. And the reason is, it has a river flowing into it, but it has no outlet. And I think that's a great metaphor to think about a lot of the world of business and a lot of people as well. If there's no outlet for the energy, the gratitude that's flowing in, it's going to die. But we're all going to die. But how do we create a sense of flow, a sense of energy that, that, that uh, empowers us all? And, And in the same sense that we're all driven by fear, I mean, I think all of us are driven by fear, although many of us are quite in denial of that. Business, I think, is particularly driven by fear. And one of the things I think is fascinating about <coughs> people like you, as, as creative artists and improvisers, is <coughs> to be an improviser, you have to be fearless. That's not to deny fear. It's not to deny fear. So that's another gift I think we can all bring into the world of business and leadership in particular. And, and, and I call this um, presentation touching the heart, and I think perhaps the key word here is courage. Or for those of you who are French speakers, courage. <laughs> <laughs> Crossing the Unknown Sea, 
And what about the heart? The heart of the The heart of the If those of you who haven't read, I really recommend reading those in terms of touching the, 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 the passion between work and oneself as a creative journey. Because as he said, you know, it's very hard to tell your father-in-law that uh, he decided to become a professional full-time poet. <laughs> and yet he's made a great career of it. <laughs> One of the things that happens in, in, in the world of business is that learning and development programs often tend to be uh, about competence, accountancy, skills. And these things are important, but my question is, are they enough? Is it enough to be focused on tasks? Because what I think most leadership calls out for is relationship, and that's what most of you are working on really well. So I'd just like to share another little story. Uh, this story is from, from about 3,000 years old. And it's a story about a, a little town in China where every year there would be a magnificent archery competition. And archers would come from all over uh, the known world to uh, present their skills. And this particular year, there was a young archer. He was very young, but he was very, very good. He was so good that with his first arrow, he could hit the center of the target. His second arrow split the first arrow, and his third arrow split the second. And he won the prize. And he stood on the stage and he won the prize. And you know, it was sad, he was quite young, and it, 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 this, this, all this came to him very early, and he was rather brash and rather arrogant. And he looked around the assembled throng, and he saw a monk, an old monk, who in the past had been a really very skillful archer. And he looked at the monk and said, beat that. And the monk just smiled and just beckoned the young man. And the young man was curious. The monk turned around, walked through the crowd, and through the narrow uh, alleyways of the town, up through the meadows, up through the woods, and into the high pasture, up and up into the mountains, and where finally they came to a place where there was a deep fissure in the ground. And both men standing on the edge of this fissure could hear the water tumbling across rocks far below. And between the two edges, two sides of the chasm, was a lock, an old, decaying, moss-covered, gentle. And the archer stepped lightly onto the log, took an arrow from his quiver, threaded his bow, selected a distant boundary marker, and <laughs> straight to the center of the target. And the monk stepped off the log and said to the young man, Read that. And the young man looked at the log, swaying in the wind, saw its treacherous surface, heard the sound of water on the rocks far below, and didn't even have the courage to step onto the log, let alone to fire his bow. The old monk said, young man, you have great skill with your bow, and very little skill with the mind that lets the arrow Uh, theory of everything, the uh, is important. And a 
and basically what, what he's done is he's divided the whole world into four quadrants to the typical consultant model. Uh, but we've got the outer world on the right hand side. In other words, what starts outside our skin, and on the left hand side we've got the inner world, what's inside of ourselves. And above the line we've got self, below the line we've got other. So in the uh, upper right quadrant, these are the skills of the young archer. They're the professional skills of uh, competency, behavior, all the things that are important to get things done in the world of business or education or any aspect of uh, our lives. Upper left, we've got uh, the personal. This is the world of personal consciousness. Constantly deepening, developing personal awareness or awakenness. <coughs> we'll talk more about, a little bit more about that later on. Lower left, we've got the cultural area, which is about shared vision, shared language, where you and I meet and create a we. And in the lower right, we've got what I call infrastructure, which is the material conditions in which we operate. So right now, we've got a kind of a electrical framework with chairs in a row, and uh, we've got some technology here. You know, this is what is. This is what is difficult to change straight away. We, we can move it around early on into a different uh, format. The infrastructure is, is what we work in. Let me say a bit more about that. Let's see if I can make it clearer. For example, in, in an organization or in an office, uh, the infrastructure might be you're still working with Windows 95. Or you might have this uh, set work that you think is. I can work against other okay. um, You may have an open plan office, or it might be everyone working in small cubicles. But these are the things. Now, one of the things I, I, I wanted to say about that story with the archer is that the archer. Whereas the, uh, the young archer operates only in the profession, I would say the old monk operates both here, he's skillful with his bow and arrow, but he also has a lot of personal awareness and mindfulness. And he's also operating here. I mean, I think the uh, slippery log is a great metaphor for the world of, of, of business or education. Every day it's different. The slippery log is changing all the time. And we have to 